And during the summer, we're going to do a series of messages from different psalms. Now, we're not going to go through all 150, okay? Uh, I'm going to do a few. Shan's going to do a few. I'm starting kind of at the beginning and going to the middle. Shan's starting in the back. But we're not going to do every one in sequence. And it's amazing, this book of Psalms, written over 3,000 years ago in the Old Testament, deals with some of the most urgent and important questions that we ask even today. And the question, the very first psalm is this, how can I be happy? That's really what Psalm 1 is all about. And we see it uh, there very clearly in that very first part of the verse where it says, blessed is the one. And as we get into the psalm, we're going to see that it's going to talk about there's two ways to try to be happy. And basically, there's two ways to live life. Now, the psalm starts out with that word blessed, and that's not a word that we use very much. In fact, a lot of people say rather than translating as blessed, it should be translated as happy. Happy is the one. And we're going to dig into a little bit more about what we really should translate that, blessed, how we should understand that. But for right now, let's just say it means happy. Happy is the one. This psalm is all about happiness. And you know what? Some people think that this psalm, because at the the very beginning of all the psalms that are collected, that it's the very first word of the very first psalm, is really kind of what the whole book of psalms is all about. All the psalms are really, in a sense, about how to be happy. And that word blessed pops up 26 times as you go throughout the book. So, all right, how can I be happy? Well, if you've been in the church very long, you're probably thinking, well, I know what Jeff is going to say about how to be happy. Jeff is going to say Jesus, right? Well, there's this old story about the children's church teacher. And, you know, when you go to children's church or Sunday school, the teacher asks questions and the kids will give answers. And the teacher asks her group of first graders this question. What is gray, has four paws, and a bushy tail, and eats acorns? One of the first graders raised his hand and he says, well, it sounds like a squirrel, but because we're in junior church, I know the answer has to be Jesus. (laughs) So when I ask, how can I be happy, I know you're thinking the answer is Jesus. And in one sense it is. But the psalm really lays out in greater detail exactly how it is that Jesus makes us happy. So let's look at that word blessed. The books of the Old Testament were really originally written in Hebrew. And there are several Hebrew words that get translated blessed. And this one is a little bit different than some of the others, although it's frequently used. And when it says blessed, what it really is describing is a person in a good situation and deserves to be congratulated. So if I say blessed is the one, I'm saying that person is in such a good situation that I want to congratulate them because their situation is very, very good. And then they should be happy when they realize how good their situation actually is. They are blessed, they are in a good situation, they should be congratulated because they are going to receive good things in the future. It's not so much they're blessed because God does something for them right then and there, but in the big picture of their lives, they're in such a good situation that good things are going to happen to them presently and in the future, and so they should be congratulated. You're in a great situation, and you should be happy because of that. Jesus uses that same word or the words of that same root when he speaks about blessed are the poor in spirit uh, uh, and so on in the Beatitudes. And of course, though, when we look in there, we're going to say that Jesus is talking about being blessed or being happy in a different way than people usually think about it. For example, in in Matthew 5.10, Jesus says it this way, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, here's what he's saying. He's saying you should be congratulated if you are going to be persecuted or you are persecuted because of righteousness. And because you should be congratulated, you should be happy that you're being persecuted for righteousness' sake. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, that just doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? That's not normally what I think of as being happy. I normally think about being persecuted as something that should make me unhappy. So why in the world would Jesus say you should be congratulated and you should be happy? It's because of this. If you're persecuted because of righteousness, it means you have a right relationship with God. You would not be persecuted for righteousness unless you had a right relationship with God. And the very fact you're being persecuted for that reason says there's something special and good about your relationship with God, and you should be congratulated for that. 
He's also saying that, you know, because your righteousness, you are living the right way. You're doing the right things. You're thinking the right way. You're behaving the right way. And you should be congratulated because of that. Now, again, it's not what we don't really think of as something to be congratulated for, persecution. But when you put it in the right perspective, you can say, yeah, I understand exactly why he's saying that. And he's going on to say, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. So you are to be congratulated. You have the right kind of relationship with God that you should have. You're living the right kind of life. And this persecution you're experiencing is just proof that you have that. So congratulations. You get a gold star. Congratulations, you're going to get the kingdom of heaven. This is why you should be happy, even though it isn't what we normally think of as being, being happiness. You see, the Bible, with blessed, and with other words, joy, it challenges that normal, typical understanding of happiness that we have. Happiness normally is thought of as a state of feeling inside us, or sometimes as we express it outwardly, that indicates we are experiencing pleasure, or experiencing satisfaction. When you feel pleasure, then we normally think you're happy. When you feel satisfaction, we normally think you're happy. But notice, it's not a long-term permanent feature. It's basically, right now, what is happening to me makes me happy because it's pleasurable or brings about satisfaction. It's not a character quality. It's not part of your inherent nature. It's just a reflection of what's going on around you. Happiness is equated with feeling pleasure or satisfaction, but it's also kind of superficial. It's not deep like joy or ecstasy or bliss or other feelings. Pleasure and satisfaction that produce normal happiness really are not that deep and substantial. Normal happiness is temporary because it's based on what is happening right now, and what is happening right now quickly and easily changes. If I, base my if I base my happiness on what's happening right now, there's always a chance. In fact, it frequently happens. Things change. Many things can come up on our life and cause us to be happy, but at the same time, many things come up on our life and cause us to be unhappy. Normal happiness is temporary. And really, what people want when they say they want happiness is they want something different. They want something more. They've had that kind of happiness, but it seems to kind of come and go and doesn't really provide deep satisfaction, deep contentment. So what are we talking about? We want to talk about a different kind of happiness. We want to talk about being blessed like the Psalms talk about, being a person who's in such a good situation that they should be congratulated because what they're in right now and what they will have in the future is so good that they can be congratulated they have it and they can be happy because they have it. You see, to be blessed is to have eternal happiness. And eternal happiness is different from normal happiness. First of all, eternal happiness is different because it's quantity. It doesn't end. Normal happiness comes and goes, but eternal happiness, it never ends. It's a trait. It's a character. It's about who we are, just not what we're feeling at the time. It reflects our character, not our circumstances. In fact, oftentimes, if you have that deep, eternal happiness, you experience it most when your circumstances are bad. Haven't you found that? Haven't you found that satisfaction that comes from the Lord, that happiness that comes from the Lord, that contentment that comes from the Lord really springs up in the midst of times that are difficult? And often when things are going well, well, you don't really want to think about it. Or you don't, I shouldn't say you don't want to. You just don't need to think about the Lord and reflect on it because what's going on right now? Of course, eternal happiness comes to us with eternal life. When we put our faith in Jesus, when we give our allegiance to Jesus, we get a relationship with him and we get blessings from him and we get a future from him that gives us eternal happiness. It begins to work inside of us through the Holy Spirit changing us, giving us the inner contentment and peace that we would not have otherwise. Eternal happiness is also different because it's a quality. It has a godlike quality. It's something that is of the highest quality. Now, I know there are things in life that we buy, and they are not of such great quality, and there are things we buy in life that are of greater quality. There's a difference between eating fast food and a gourmet meal. You know, Well, that's the difference between temporary happiness and eternal happiness. There's a difference between Ikea furniture and furniture made of hardwood, right? We know that. And there's a difference between a home made of bricks and one made of straw. You see, eternal happiness is different from temporary happiness. 
It's different because one lasts forever and one doesn't. One is of a greater quality and one is of a poor quality and they have different sources. Temporary circumstances will produce temporary happiness. But eternal happiness comes from knowing God and focusing on the good things that God has planned for you. Of course, the person who has eternal happiness can also have temporary happiness, right? We still enjoy that. We still like that. We still want that. But we know that eternal happiness is better by far. Being a person who is to be congratulated, congratulated because of the relationship you have with God and because of the great future God has planned for you and has promised you, you should be congratulated when you have a relationship with God that takes your sin away, that gives you a new heart, a new character, God's spirit in our life, that gives us a guarantee of eternal life forever to God. You should be congratulated. And as you're congratulated, you should think, wow, what I have is wonderful. I am happy. And that'll lead you to the greatest happiness. Okay, no doubt some of you are thinking, well, that's great, but how do I get this great happiness? Great ha well, that's what the Psalm's all about. Psalm 1 tells us, let me read verse 1 and 2 again. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. So we're going to start with the second verse first. Here's what's going to happen. You'll be happy when you think God's thoughts and live them. When you think God's thoughts, you're going to see life from God's perspective and you're going to start understanding that what you have in Christ is far better than anything else you could have. You can understand that you have assured of a great future, that God is with you. And the more you understand that and the more you live that, the more you're going to have the deeper eternal happiness that will give you contentment in all circumstances. You'll see things differently and thus you'll be happy even when normal people would be sad at times. You'll see things differently and you'll be happy even when people are sad at times because you have a different perspective on life that knowing God's word and thinking God's thoughts gives you. Now, I've got five grandchildren and Linus is eight. He's the second youngest, youngest and he likes to play chess. And when I come to house, his house, you know what he says? He says, Grandpa, do you want to play chess? Of course, that's why I'm there. I'm there to play with the kids, right? I'm playing to read books to the kids, so I, of course, say yes. Now, I have played chess a long time, and I'm far from being a master, but I do understand the di game differently than an eight-year-old would understand the game. And one insight you have in chess, the one thing you learn is that there are times that you move a piece and you let your opponent capture it because their capturing your piece will change the arrangement of the pieces on the board so that you're in a better situation. That's called sacrificing a piece. You sacrifice a piece so that you can win the game or get to be in a greater situation. Now, I understand that a little bit better than he does because I played for a while. And so it's not uncommon for me to move a piece someplace and you can see the grin come on his face because he said, oh, <laughs> Grandpa didn't know what he was doing there. He made a bad move. Of course, I don't grin because I don't want to tip off the fact that, no, this is not a bad move. This is a good. But inside, I'm content. Inside, I'm happy. But I don't show it. And then he takes my piece and then I move my piece and say, checkmate. <laughs> and he becomes sad. <laughs> and I become happy. <laughs> it's because I have a different perspective in the game than he had. And you know what? That's true about us in life. When you have God's thoughts, you have a different perspective. And so something that somebody else would see as a sacrifice, you're saying no to a sin, or you're serving sacrificially, or, or, or you're doing something that they, you're not doing something they would do, they don't understand it. But you understand it. And therefore you have joy, even when to somebody else it might look like a sacrifice. Okay, I gotta be honest with you though. Linus beat me at chess the last time I was there. <laughs> He had been in chess books from the library and practicing. <laughs> he only beat me once. I won the other five games that day. <laughs> but he did win. And I knew he would eventually, right? Because that was the same way with me growing up. I played my older brother, almost never won. Then I started occasionally winning. Then I started winning a third of the time. Then we started going about 50-50. But anyway, he's beginning to understand the game differently. When you understand life from God's perspective, you see things differently and you can have eternal happiness and be blessed. Now, how do you get God's perspective? Well, you get God's perspective from God's word. And you notice this passage talks about delighting in the law of the Lord and meditating on it. 
we get God's perspective from God's word. And so one thing we have to start doing is we have to start choosing to delight in God's thoughts, choosing to delight in God's word. And now you might say, well, how can I choose to delight in something? Isn't delighting in it or not delighting in it just something natural? Either you delight or you don't want delight. Isn't it an instinct, not something you choose to do? Well, I think it's a bit more chosen than we realize because there's a whole lot of things that at one point we don't delight in that later on we do delight in because of our choices. Now, when we moved to New York City in 1988, I did not delight in ballet. It was not something I would watch, and if I did, it was a painful experience. <laughs> However, my daughter started taking ballet lessons. And so what did I do? I took them to rehearsals. I watched the rehearsals. I took them to performances. Uh, uh, their, I went to their performances. I took them to the New York City Ballet. And you know what? Over time, watching them rehearse, taking them rehearsal, going to performance, I decided, you know what? I like ballet after all. It's, it's, it's pretty good, all right? Broccoli. When I got married, I was a picky eater. I still am to some degree. I did not like broccoli, but Lori did, and she cooked it. I did not like broccoli, but I love Lori. So I, <laughs> so I ate my broccoli. <laughs> and gradually, over time, it became okay. And then it became pretty good. And so right now, I could say that I now delight in broccoli. All right, Brussels sprouts, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> you see, you can cherish something. You can learn to cherish it. You have to expose yourself to it. You have to reinforce that. You've got to keep on doing it. But if right now you don't cherish God's word, you can. You can. Start taking it in. Start reading it. Start putting it into practice, and you'll cherish it. 1 Timothy 4, 7, Paul says this, Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. Notice that phrase, train yourself to be godly. It's something you can engage in activities to train yourself. And you have to train yourself because it doesn't come naturally. And that's what you do. And so what? You know, when you go about the process of training yourself, you end up being able to do things that you couldn't have done before. I mean, think about that in life. How many of the things you do now were not things that you could just naturally do, but because you trained yourself, you were able to do those things. Training over time, you'll act actually do things you could not naturally do, and some of those things that you couldn't naturally do before will come to you very naturally. So choose to delight yourself in God's word and train yourself to do that. Because when you do that, you'll be more eager to take God's word in, and the more you take God's word in, the more you'll see the world and life from God's perspective, and the more you'll get the eternal happiness that comes from doing that. Also, fill your mind with God's thoughts. So the passage says the law of the, the, law of the Lord, but this is not really limiting it just to the first five books of the Bible that are called the law or the Old Testament. It basically is saying anything that comes from God, God's instructions, Old Testament, New Testament, all those things, and what it's making the point really is is that it has to be what comes from the Lord. Okay, you know, we really would not know anything about God unless God revealed it to us. We can't put God under a microscope. We can't do expert, uh, uh, telescopes either. We can't touch God. We can't do experiments on God. But God reveals, us so, reveals himself to us. He gives us information through the Bible. And that's the difference between having a religion that's based on revelation where God reveals truth to us, and have a religion that's simply one of our own creation, that it comes from our thoughts and our desires. And it's kind of one that we want the way we like it. So fill your mind with God's thoughts. And this passage uses the word meditate, meditate on God's word. Now, I know about you, but when I first hear the word meditate, I think of more of, a, of an Eastern guru sitting you cross legs and, 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 and go home or something like that. That's not what the Bible's talking about. In that, you want to empty your mind, but in the Bible's meditation, you want to fill your mind, and you want to fill your mind with God's word, and you want to ponder it over and over again and chew on it so you can get everything out of it. it it's not just setting apart a special time in the morning or evening where you pray and, and talk to God and read his word. That's a good thing to do, but meditate is like all the time you are reflecting God's word and thinking about God's word and how it applies to your life and how you live it out. Regardless of the time of day, you figure out how to respond in a godly manner because you know what God's word said because you've thought about it again and again and again. The apostle Paul puts it this way, 
Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Fill your mind with such things, and you know what? You're going to start getting God's perspective on life, and you're going to look at life from God's viewpoint, and as a result of that, you're going to have that deep eternal happiness, and you'll happen when good things are, ha are present and when bad times are present. Paul says again this way in Colossians 3, 1, Since then you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. You've heard the saying, you are what you eat, but in another sense, you are what you think. And what you think is a reflection of what you ta eat mentally. Take in your mind. Fill your mind with God's thoughts. And when you're told to, you know, fill your mind with God's thoughts, right? Now, the passage says we are to cherish uh, or delight in God's word and we're to meditate on God's word. And, you know, whenever you're told to do this, there's a kind of a corollary. Don't do something else, right? If you're to meditate on God's word, fill your mind with God's word, then you should do something else. And that is, don't fill your mind with thoughts that aren't from God. The passage doesn't specifically say that, but that's a corollary. If you're supposed to do X, it means you're not supposed to do Y. So it's important that on one hand that we don't say, okay, I'm going to fill my mind with God's thoughts, but I'm also going to fill my mind with bad thoughts, with things that aren't helpful, with things that contradict God. Because what, when you do that, you're just going to be confused inside. You're not going to have harmony in your mind. True happiness, eternal happiness, well, that's important. And it ca doesn't come from, from circumstances being right. But a lot of times we fill our mind with the thought that the only way I can be happy is if all the circumstances in my life are the way I want. If you fill your mind with that, you're going to be an unhappy person because you can't control life like that. You're not going to be in control. You can't make everything work out. And you know what it's going to do? It's going to cause conflict. And why is it going to con cause conflict? Because you're going to identify people that are preventing you from getting the circumstances you want in life, and they're going to become your enemy. You're going to start trying to control them, and they're not going to like it, and they're going to push back. Sometimes because you want to organize life so you get what you want, you do things that are wrong, that are unhelpful, that are immoral. So we've got to reject certain things. We've got to say that we're going to fill our mind with God's thoughts, but not with thoughts that aren't from God. Also, we've got to realize that true happiness does not come just from inside, what's naturally inside the human being, because we're fallen. And so what's inside of us is corrupt and broken. So what we need is God outside. Of course, he needs to come in us through his Holy Spirit and begin to change us. That's God doing it. So we've got to fill our mind with good things, and we also got to be very aggressive not to fill our mind with thoughts that aren't from God. And I know that's hard. We're bombarded with lots of thoughts. And, and to some of the we have to take them in to analyze them and understand them. You know, there's a certain uh, testing that you've got to do. But don't overwhelm yourself with those things. Now, when I raise my children, and probably a lot of parents, when they raise their children, you kind of want to restrict a certain degree how much they take in that's not godly, it's not healthy. And we did that to our children. And I remember one time, in fact, it was at a church picnic, where one of my daughter Sarah's friends came to the picnic, and she came up to see me and says, Mr. Butler, I don't know why it is that you restrict what Sarah can watch, the movie she can see, and things like that. You know, she's going to see those things anyway. That's part of life. And I said, say, well, I agree. Some of that stuff is part of life, and she's going to see those things. There are things that are part of life that are just going to come. Just like, you know, car exhausts. And this was a long time ago, so buses had diesel exhaust. And I said, just like those buses and those car exhausts, you, you're just going to breathe it in. But that's not an excuse to put your nose in the exhaust pipe of a bus, right? <laughs> it's one thing that you're going to just get that in. And so what I try to say is all we're really doing is trying to keep our nose out of the exhaust pipes of buses. And so that's for us. If you want to be happy, you take in God's good things, but you avoid the bad things that are there. To be eternally happy, cherish God's word, fill your mind with it, avoid thoughts that aren't from God. And of course, thinking about them implies actually living them as well. Well, verse 2 tells us what we should do. Verse 1 tells us what we shouldn't do. It says, I'll read that again. It says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, the stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers. Now again, I'm going to start off with what's implied by this, all right? So it states, don't hang out with this group, and there's an implication you should hang out with another group, right? You'll be happy when you choose to be with God's people, people that think God's thoughts. You won't be blessed if you hang out with the wrong people, but you will 
if you hang out with the right people. Hang out with God's people because God's people are going to help you think God's thoughts and see the world through God's perspective. Of course, not all God's people do this because some of God's people think just like the world does. So, so be selective there. And of course, you can't isolate yourself from all people. But we're saying, who is it you're going to build those deep relationships with? Who is it you're going to spend an increasing amount of time with? Hang out with the people that are going to influence you to start thinking the right way, to keep thinking the right way, and do things consistent with what you're thinking. The passage makes the point there are certain people that will not help you have eternal happiness. They might help you with temporary happiness, right? They might help you to enjoy some pleasure at the time being and for a while, but they may not help you with eternal happiness. In fact, they may make you harder for you to experience it. So what do you really want? Do you really want temporary happiness or do you want eternal happiness? Avoid people that don't think God's thoughts. That's exactly what the passage is saying. Blessed are the one who does not walk in step with the wicked. Blessed are the ones who does not stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. Now, it sounds a little narrow. I know, but it's healthy. It's good. Sometimes it sounds narrow not to eat all those fatty foods, right? But it's, it's good for you. Sometimes it sounds narrow. Don't eat that sugary food, but, but it's good for you. And you know what? Notice exactly what they're talking about here. They're talking about people that are really wicked, sinners, mockers. Now, some people may be really nice, but that doesn't mean they're spiritually healthy for you. 1 Corinthians 5.33, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Now, we can't avoid all people, and we shouldn't avoid all people. We have a responsibility to be witnesses to Christ in the world, to let our light shine. But notice the ones that it says here, wicked, sinners, mockers. There are just some people that you cannot get too close with and too enmeshed with in your life, or they're going to have you moving away from God, not closer to God. They're going to have you start seeing and thinking about the world from an go- ungodly perspective, not from a godly perspective. You will not be happy, at least eternally happy, if you build too deep a relationships with such people. But instead, pursue people that think God's thoughts. Christian community will bring you happiness. It will bring you eternal happiness. Now, sermons might inspire you, and they may even entertain you at some times. But community, who you build those deep relationships with, that is what is going to truly shape you and determine the kind of person you are and the kind of character you have. Your friends are the future you. Think about it. The people you hang out with will determine the kind of person you become. And so think about that. I know I thought about that when my kids were growing up, and other parents think about that because the kids they hung out with are going to determine the future person they're going to be. Hearing once a week pep talk at church can be good, but who they really spend time with on long haul will determine their character and the kind of person. So you pursue time with God's people. Build relationships with them. Make sure that's part of what's important. Because you see, faith requires perseverance, and perseverance is reinforced by the people we hang out with. And we talked about this last week. We talked about this last week. Remember last week we talked about um, the the, the, um, um, challenge the Joshua moment of recognizing you're responsible for the spiritual well-being of others. And you know, that goes both ways. You need to go cling to other people so they can help you spiritually, and you need to go pursue other people so you can help them spiritually. I didn't get to read this passage last week, so I'm going to slip it in here. Hebrews 3.12. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Notice it's you have a responsibility to see to the other people don't have that happening in their life. Well, how can you do that if you're not together, right? But encourage one another daily. Notice daily? That's not weekly. Encourage one another daily, as long as called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Sin's deceitful. It'll get you. It'll creep up on you. But if you're around other people, they can help you avoid that. We have come to share we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original convictions firmly to the end. Well, you're blessed if you can be congratulated by having a right relationship with God, by living a right life, because you're part of God's eternal family, his eternal kingdom. You have God as your father to support you, encourage you, and help you in this life. You have the promise of eternal life in heaven. 
And you can be happy in any situation because you look at the big picture of what you're to be congratulated about. This perspective does not come easy. It's not natural. But if you fill your mind with God's thoughts and you build relationships with people that reinforce that, you can have it. Well, what are the results? What are the results of thinking and living God's thoughts? Let's read verse 3 and find out. That person, the person who delights in God's law, who meditates on it, who fills their mind with it, that has God's perspective, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do, prosper. Now, what I think is great about this verse is it's very realistic because you know what it talks about? Seasons. And you know what? Life goes through seasons, right? There are seasons that plants go through. There are seasons that we go. Plants go through spring and summer seasons where the environment is favorable. It's pleasant for them. They grow. And then they go through the fall when things start getting cold and they start losing leaves. And then winter comes and it kind of threatens to kill the plants because it's so awful. And sometimes there's droughts that come that almost just completely starve it. You see, you can't cut out the winter and fall seasons in life. It's part of life. You see, happiness is not going to come if you always have to be in spring or summer. But you know what? If you plant your roots down deep, like a tree next to streams of water, you always have access to what you need. So you can always have that eternal happiness, no matter what season in life you're experiencing. And the person who has deep roots spiritually like the tree that has deep, root, deep roots spiritual, like the tree that has deep roots physically and can always get water will flourish and prosper. He is the, and that is the result of thinking God's thoughts because you've cherished his word, you delighted in his words, and you filled your mind with that. Now what's the results of not thinking God's words and not living God's way? What's well, the opposite? Verse one, not so the wicked. They are like the chaff that the wind blows away. Now, this is the imagery that is not very natural to us, so you've got to have it explained a little bit. Back then, when they would harvest wheat, you know, wheat has the outer husk that is just like straw. It's not, it has no real value. And there's the inner kernel that gets grained and turned into flour that you have bread. And they have to separate that. And the way they would separate that is they would do it a couple of different ways. They'd gather all the wheat heads together with, with both parts. And sometimes they had these poles they would beat on it and to get separate it. Sometimes they'd have animals walk over to separate it. And then they would take like a pitchfork and they would dig underneath it and they would toss it all up in the air. And the wind would blow the part that was of no value, the chaff away. And the part that was valuable would fall back to the ground. And what this passage is saying is that the wicked... Those that pursue temporary happiness, not eternal happiness, uh, they're not stable. They're not sturdy. They're just going to blow away at some point. The imagery here is, would you rather be a tree with deep roots by springs of water, or do you want to be chaff, which is basically worthless and blows away? Now, that kind of is a reminder of the parable of, of the wise and foolish builders. And why I say that is because sometimes it's not always obvious what's going on. I mean, when the wheat's growing, the chaff part looks, it looks valuable and good. It's only after the harvest and the separation takes place you can see that. The parable of the wise and foolish builder, builder when circumstances were good, both houses looked just fine. It was only when circumstances got bad that you saw the house that was really built upon the rock. When circumstances change, that which is not built on something solid. When circumstances change, that which does not have eternal happiness will fall and have problems. Of course, there are eternal results as well. It's not just a temporary results in how life gets on today. And those are talked about in Psalm 1-5. Uh, Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. The wicked's end may not be clear when life is living because while life's going on, many people who don't follow God, don't think God's thoughts, look to be doing pretty well, don't they? Sometimes they look to be a lot, doing a lot better than those that do. But from God's perspective, there's no future for them because there'll come a time in which there'll be a judgment when those that assembled with the wicked will not be able to stand with those that are among the godly. And those among the godly will be welcomed into God's kingdom. If you don't stand with the righteous in life, you won't stand with the righteous in death. The assembly of the righteous is composed of those who have a relationship with God and enjoy his presence. 
and they experience his presence now and in the life to come. Of course, the most important eternal results are eternal, not just temporary. I mean, it's great to have that basic relationship with God where you have that happiness that is there, whether things are good or bad. It's great to have that right now, but what's most important is the eternal results that come from having a right relationship with God. And those are described in Psalm 1-6. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked ends to destruction. Passage basically says, in the end, you'll reap what you sow. What you're up, you will reap what you sow. If in life you've sowed to the flesh, if you've sowed to those things that will bring you temporary happiness, temporary pleasure, then in the end you will reap that. But if you sow into things that will bring about eternal happiness, if you sow in those things that bring about a right relationship with God, you will reap that. You s- it's not like God sits there and judges. God simply says this is what the person has chosen by how they live their life. And therefore, this is the destination they get for that choice. And this is the destination they get for that choice. Hebrews 9.27 says, Just as a man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment. At the end of life, we all stand before God and everyone will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And we'll hear either welcome, come into my kingdom, or away from me. Have you ever thought what it would be like at that moment? Now, hear me say that, since we don't normally talk like that. You might say, well, Jeff's starting to sound like some of those crazy people, like cr- crazy preachers I see on YouTube. Well, there's certain truth about it. And although they may say it in a crazy manner, it's still what the Bible says and something we need to know and something we need to reflect on. Psalm 1 tells us the person who knows God lives with eternal happiness now and he endures throughout all the seasons of life. And when he or she dies, they will be welcomed into eternal glory. The ungodly live in a life which oftentimes ends up in senseless futility. When pain comes, they have no recourse. When grief comes, they have no help. When they suffer, they're filled with sorrow. And when they die, they go to judgment. The passage basically talks about two paths to happiness or two ways to live. One's a false path and one's a true path. The two ways to live are God's way and my own way. One will lead to eternal life and one will lead to eternal death. And if the path you're on right now is the wrong path, there's good news. You can always change paths. You're not stuck there. God welcomes your turns. Ezekiel 18.32 says, For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord. Repent and live. If you've chosen the wrong path, pursuing the wrong happiness, make a U-turn change. John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God offers forgiveness for all of our sins through the death of Jesus Christ for all who put their faith in him. All believe that death covers their sins and give their allegiance to Jesus. Romans 10, 9 says this, If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. There is a need for a declaration of the lordship of Jesus. Not just the forgiveness, but the lordship of Jesus as well. And we confirm that in baptism, Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you receive the Holy Spirit. We talked about it a couple years ago, how in baptism a death takes place and a new life begins. And then we got to make sure that we follow Jesus because Jesus says, come, follow me. Everybody wants to be happy. We just got to be happy the right way because only one type of happiness will truly satisfy, truly last in this life, in the life to come. Choose God. Let's pray.